Sean asks, Rhonda, have you considered taking meat completely out of your diet? Also, which meats do you consume? Where do you get them? And how frequently do you consume meats? The truth of the matter is that there have been many, many correlative studies that have found that higher meat consumption is associated with a significantly higher risk of cancer and cancer mortality. This fact alone should be enough to at least make a person give thought to their position on the subject, especially when it's a relationship that keeps showing up. That said, one of the largest studies to date, which was published in in JAMA Internal Medicine in 2016, looked at meat consumption and all-cause mortality and cancer-related mortality, found something very interesting that is very important to this narrative. Specifically, it found that a high intake of meat from animal sources was only associated with a higher mortality rate and cancer mortality rate in people that had at least one other factor associated with an unhealthy lifestyle, such as being obese or having a history of smoking or being physically inactive or being a heavy consumer of alcohol. Meat consumers that were healthy by not having any of these aforementioned unhealthy lifestyle factors did not have a higher mortality rate or cancer mortality rate. Critical to the meat consumption and cancer link is the fact that protein increases IGF-1, something that research suggests may be an important link in this meat-cancer relationship. Earlier, we talked a little bit about the importance of IGF-1 and its beneficial context for muscle hypertrophy, but this cancer link is a trade-off that's worth paying attention. Amino acids, and particularly essential amino acids such as leucine, which are more abundant in meat, are the most potent dietary activators of the IGF-1 pathway. IGF-1 does a lot of stuff. It's a growth factor that plays a very important role during early growth development and also is important in promoting and maintaining muscle mass, as we discussed, and also neuronal function. There are many positive benefits to IGF-1, but there is also a trade-off, as there so often is in biology. IGF-1 is a potent growth factor that allows cells that have been damaged to survive when they otherwise would die. It is important to understand that IGF-1 does not cause damage to the cell. Rather, it allows damaged cells to live and reproduce so that they can make more copies of the damaged cells. IGF-1 is known as a tumor promoter because it promotes the growth of cancer cells. Other factors that cause DNA damage, such as reactive oxygen species, which are byproducts of normal metabolism, and inflammatory cytokines, which are byproducts of immune activation, can initiate cancer by causing DNA damage, which is the initial insult that can lead to a damaged cell. Our body has a protective mechanism that can sense that damage and kill the cell, but the presence of an abundance of IGF-1 overrides this mechanism and can allow that damaged cell to survive. This is why IGF-1 can be fuel for cancer growth, not initiation, but growth. That distinction may be important. As a pathway, IGF-1 is actually of great interest in both cancer and longevity research. We know from animal evidence that growth hormone and IGF-1 deficient mice are resistant to cancer. Interestingly, this evidence isn't limited to animal research. Some humans also have polymorphisms in the gene that encodes for the IGF-1 receptor, which leads to a decrease in IGF-1 activity in these individuals. Similar to animal research, we see a decreased incidence in cancer and also longer lifespans in these people. Human evidence also exists for the exact opposite, where people that have genetic polymorphisms that cause them to have increased IGF-1 also have an increased cancer risk. If we get away from genetic polymorphisms and look just at people with higher circulating IGF-1 in their serum, something that actually can be quantified, this also has been associated with an increased risk of several different common types of cancers, including breast, colon, and prostate. So high IGF-1, higher cancer risk. Low IGF-1, reduced cancer risk, and even longevity. With this new understanding of the relationship of meat consumption to IGF-1 production and IGF-1's relationship with cancer and longevity, where it even inhibits the longevity gene FOXO3, it would be very tempting and very easy to take an absolutist position and never touch meat again, putting aside all the other reasons why someone might make such a choice. But as I mentioned earlier, there are good aspects to IGF-1. IGF-1 has been shown to increase lean muscle and reduce adipose tissue simultaneously. It acts as a neurotrophic factor, increasing the growth of new brain cells. It prevents brain cells from dying. It's pretty clear that I actually want some IGF-1 activity. I think this is a really important take home with respect to IGF-1 because IGF-1 has a good and a bad side, but I think exercise is the way to tip the balance towards the good. Exercise, whether we're talking about aerobic or resistance training, has been shown to lower serum IGF-1 levels because exercise causes our muscles to take up IGF-1. Additionally, IGF-1 has been shown in rat studies to cross the blood-brain barrier in response to exercise and increases neurogenesis. 
This also means the exercise lowers circulating concentrations of IGF-1, which means it has less of a chance to promote the growth of damaged cells or inhibit FOXO3 and other tissues. If we circle back to the original study I mentioned where meat consumption was only associated with a higher all-cause mortality and cancer mortality, if one other unhealthy lifestyle factor was present, this makes perfect sense if most of the bad effects are mediated through IGF-1. Since I do not have any of those unhealthy lifestyle factors, and I understand what I perceive to be the mechanism behind the relationship between cancer and meat consumption, I have decided to keep some meat in my diet. Since I already got into a meal breakdown where I talk about the meals I eat in a typical week in another question, I'll skip to the last part of this question, which is where do I get my meat from? I usually get them from a local grocery store or the farmer's market. I buy wild fish, mostly Alaskan salmon, grass-fed beef, and pasture-raised chicken with no antibiotics or hormones. 